Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to What's Up With That, the show that brings you interesting people, places, cultures, and subcultures here in the South Bay, the San Francisco Bay Area, the state of California, and beyond. And tonight, what's up with ALS? What is ALS? And what are the issues relating to ALS, better known as Lou Gehrig's disease? Well, my first exposure to ALS was when I was attending a high school football game. It was Los Gatos High School playing Monta Vista High School. Go Matadors! And me and my friend were sitting in the grandstands and we had noticed that um, a golf cart type vehicle came out on the field and everybody in the stadium stood up and cheered and were applauding and I was like, what's going on? And a friend of mine said, well, that's the coach of Los Gatos High School. And I said, well, what's going on with him? They said, well, he has some kind of disease and nobody really knows what it is. Uh, but he said that he calls his kids gay, his plays that's right. through lip reading from his wife. I said, wow, this is pretty weird. We have a good chance of winning. Well, you know what? We lost. So anyways, tonight we're going to learn a lot about ALS, a mysterious disease, Lou Gehrig's disease from a pro. Please welcome to the show, Linda DeMello. Thank she you, is Andrew. from the ALS Association of the Greater Bay Area. Welcome to the show. Thank you for How having you me. Well, what's up with that? Well, what is ALS? Well, the scientific name that most people have trouble pronouncing is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Mm -hmm. And it's referred to as ALS. But usually, people think about ALS in terms of the famous person, Lou Gehrig, who was diagnosed with ALS in 1939 and died, even though many people called him the Iron Horse, in less than two years wow. after he gave that famous speech on July 4th in Yankee Stadium. And so how common is this disease? Well, in any one time, there are about 35,000 people throughout the United States that have the disease. Mm -hmm. But that really doesn't represent the, the impact of the disease right. in, in this country and beyond. ALS does not discriminate. It affects everyone. The youngest person in the San Francisco Bay Area to be diagnosed with ALS was a 14-year-old girl. Wow. Uh, Lou Gehrig died of ALS at the age of, 19, uh, at the age of 39. Mm -hmm. um, many people think that it's an older person's disease, but in actuality, the average age of incidence is 56. Wow, so it's, yeah. And what happens is that it presents in two ways. Um, often people are at the height of their lives, mm -hmm. um, remarkably in good shape, and they begin to drop things, or they lose strength in their feet, they begin to trip. Or um, some people know Bruce Edwards, who was Tom Watson's cat, uh, caddy, mm -hmm. who died of ALS. And Bruce had what was called the bull bar onset where for him, the weakness of the muscles started in his throat and mm -hmm. he started to slur. But eventually, the motor neurons or just nerve cells begin to die in the brain and in the spinal cord. And when they do, we begin to lose all voluntary muscles. So that means you begin to lose the ability to walk, mm -hmm. to move, to eat, and eventually to breathe. Mm -hmm. And what, what would be like, a, what's the common, some common things that you hear from these people? Well, they never thought that they would be so dependent mm -hmm. on another person right. for their ability to live mm -hmm. their lives. And it's it's got to be just very, very frustrating. And, and in the advanced stages of the disease, someone has to do everything for you. Mm -hmm. A feeding tube helps you eat. Hoists and wheelchairs help you move. And if you choose, a ventilator will breathe for you. Mm -hmm. And that takes extraordinary care and support from caretakers and families and friends, yeah. 24 hours right. a day, seven days a week. And that's what you mean when you say how much it really affects because it doesn't only affect the patient. There's a huge amount of people that are involved in this thing who really have to also you know, give up a lot to to become the caretaker. and Often the primary caretaker will leave their job mm -hmm. to provide most of the care. Care is very expensive and mm -hmm. even if you have the resources to pay for it, it's difficult to find caregivers mm -hmm. to come into homes to yeah. care for people. 
And that's one of the extraordinary problems that people with ALS face mm -hmm. is the kind of care and support they need to live their lives. So how do you find caregivers for, for these people? I mean, what well, usually families begin to designate someone within the family that mm -hmm. takes the primary role. Mm -hmm. And often, because it is a family disease, it affects everyone. Right. Someone who may be in college comes home mm -hmm. to take a primary caregiving role. Right. Or very young children, much too early in mm -hmm. their lives, become caregivers as well. Yeah, and I would, I would bet that in, in many instances it puts a lot of pressure on the, the family itself. And so you probably deal with a lot of those kinds of issues too. Yes, it's a family disease. And so as a result, we provide support as a chapter to provide respite for primary caregivers. And we have a Care for Children's program mm -hmm. that allows children to stay after school and enjoy other children. Right. As the disease progresses, what happens often is that children stop asking friends to come home. Uh huh. Yeah, well, that's sad. I mean. Or they come home because they have to take on a caregiving role. Mm -hmm. So we try to enable the families to be able to afford having a child participate in after school sports or right. programs. Well, you have to, yeah. That's right, or summer programs uh -huh. so they can be with other children. Yeah, but well, you're very right. It is a family mm -hmm. disease impacting not only the immediate family, right. but really friends and neighbors and colleagues. Well, we're going to look at a video clip right now. These are testimonials from some people living with ALS. So let's watch these videos, and I think the viewers will learn a little bit more about what these people are going through. So let's see them. My spirituality allows me to experience life in a much richer way. So everything around me takes on a brighter facade. I feel as if I am seeing reality in a much different way. I recognize that I don't have a long time yet, but I'm going to take every day and try to find something that's good about that day, something that I'm grateful for. And it's wonderful. I mean, that's another thing I didn't do with my life before. When you feel out of control and you just need to rail at the world, the association has um, opportunities to volunteer, but also the walks. Organizing friends and family to be able to raise money that we knew then stayed within the ALS community. It didn't just kind of go into this big pool of money somewhere. People all in the they were throwing money at the organization. They didn't know where it is going to go. I have a walker. I have a wheelchair. Thanks to the ALS thing. Hi, we're back here talking about ALS, and I would, you know, I was when I was doing my research, I was reading about a strand that they had identified in Guam, where I lived for um, a long time, and it said that it affected the natives and it affected um, the military men as well. And I was wondering, you know, what are like some of the contributing factors of ALS, and, and particularly in Guam, they said it had to do something with the betel nut. What what do you know about this and, and what are some other factors that contribute to ALS? Well, one of the frustrations about ALS is that it was originally identified as a unique disease in the 1860s in France. Mm -hmm. And here we are 150 right. years Imagine later. Imagine that, huh? <laughs> and we're still <laughs> confounded about what really causes ALS. Mm -hmm. The research tells us now as we begin to do gene mapping and have the right. capacities and technologies that we've never had before, that scientists are beginning to understand that it probably isn't one disease, that oh, it's really? 15 to 18 different strains of a disease. Dang. And <laughs> there are, they think, different genetic predispositions yeah. that um, people have 
but that those predispositions may be triggered by environmental insults. Mm -hmm. And what does environmental insult mean? It may, be, me, may mean back trauma. It may be exposure to chemicals. Right. It may be something that people are um, traumatizing their body with and they don't realize that. Mm -hmm. We really don't know. In Guam, there was a high concentration of toxins mm -hmm. um, that they recognized was contributing to the incidence of the disease. We do know that um, veterans today have a much higher uh, likelihood of having ALS as compared to the general public. And that has to do with exposure to uh, weaponry and chemical? Well, and chemical? We, many of us think that that may be the case, but there still isn't any proof. Mm -hmm. That's all, con, you know. all we know right now is that there's a higher incidence. Mm -hmm. And so the ALS Association is working with the Department of Defense and the mm -hmm. Veterans Administration and the National Institutes for mm -hmm. Health to be able to get the funding that we mm -hmm. need to really explore why is it that people, what causes it, mm -hmm. and then ultimately what will cure it. Mm -hmm. And so it's gotta be frustrating when you talk about research, because when you think about research, you know, there's the A1 list of research, and you know, cancer, of course, and I'm not saying anything bad about cancer research, but it does seem that there is sort of a hierarchy in the medical system, and I don't know who decides this, I don't know who, who you know sits on their high horse and, and can make the decision what, of where we're going to spend our money and what disease is more important to you know what do you deal with when you try to get funding? I mean, who, who do you go to? What obstacles are you facing? Um, what's well, up I with think that? the greatest frustration about ALS research was that until recently, the scientists really didn't have the technologies to study neurological disease. Mm -hmm. And I once heard a scientist remark that studying neurological diseases 20 years ago was like opening a computer and tossing in a chip and hoping it landed yeah. in the right place. Right. I mean, and that's how pro really basic um, and limited the research was. Now with the movement of molecular, the advancement of molecular biology uh, and many of the science, and all of that, and gene mapping, yeah. we're beginning to, to develop the kinds of knowledge we need to understand what causes it. Mm -hmm. So the ALS Association works in three ways in research. One is they have a scientific committee, much like the Manhattan Project, mm -hmm. where they decided what were the kinds right. of information you need to be able to understand the disease. And so the ALS Association will go out and um, encourage leading scientists to work in these areas. Then they will ask scientists throughout the world to submit requests for funding for different approaches to understanding the disease mm -hmm. or treating the disease. And then the third area of research, which I find fascinating, is that they are actively, the association is actively involved in recruiting young scientists mm -hmm. who are very knowledgeable and right. skilled about the newest technologies. Mm -hmm. Because neurological research is really the newest frontier. Mm -hmm. And so to come in as a young scientist and capitalize on the new technologies um, are really exciting opportunities for them. But they're also an exciting opportunities for our patients right. because ultimately it's research that creates mm -hmm. hope yeah. that we can discover a treatment or a cure. Mm -hmm. So our chapter is actively involved in raising money for research mm -hmm. and to work and working with through mm -hmm. our national organization with the National Institutes of Health and other yeah. areas of the government to fund leading edge research. Yeah. So there's a lot of like test trial kinds of research, you know, where they go uh, introduce a patient to a, a new developing drug or something. Well, one of, again, you talked about frustrations. There's only one FDA approved drug mm -hmm. to treat ALS. So there's a high need to increase right. the kinds of drugs people need to be able to at least slow the progression of mm -hmm. the disease and ultimately cure it. Mm -hmm. and, and like you said before, the, these kinds of things are the things that probably offer the patients the most hope. I mean, they're looking for anything. That's There's correct. only one drug. That's, that's not a lot. There's not, no. a lot, not a lot of choices there. So how do you treat ALS? It's very difficult to treat because it affects the person's entire body and physical system. So the ALS Association has developed a treatment model which creates a team of seven experts, mm -hmm. a neurologist, a nurse, an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, mm -hmm. a speech pathologist, 
a social worker and a respiratory specialist, and often a nutritionist. Those are the specialties that need to work together as a team. It's a very costly treatment model. Mm -hmm. And I needn't tell you with our healthcare system today mm -hmm. and the challenges of insurance and reimbursements, mm -hmm. there's a huge gap between right. what it costs a patient mm -hmm. and the insurance that mm -hmm. is available. So our chapter steps in through the funds we raise to close the gap Mm -hmm. so that all patients who need this kind of multidisciplinary care can get mm -hmm. it. And back to your earlier question, we have two multidisciplinary clinics that are certified as multidisciplinary treatment models. One is at UCSF, U University of mm -hmm. California at San Francisco, and the other is at the Forbes Norris Clinic at California Pacific Medical Center okay. in San Francisco. There are only 30 of these centers in the country, and we have two here. Mm -hmm. But with the progression of the disease, even having talented and committed specialists in San Francisco isn't enough. Right. Because as the disease progresses, uh -huh. it's more and more difficult for patients to come to Just San Francisco. to go anywhere, yeah. So we take the treatment to them, mm -hmm. and we have a satellite clinic in Monterey, we have a satellite wow. clinic in Fresno, and we have a satellite clinic in Modesto. And our hope is with future funding to also use telemedicine Mm -hmm. to reach our isolated patients or more isolated patients in Northern California, in Del Norte County, mm -hmm. and in Humboldt Co right. County. Well, you have a lot on your plate, huh? <laughs> we do. And people ask me, why do I do this? Mm -hmm. I don't have a direct connection to ALS. Uh -huh. And the reality is, it's the patients. Yeah. And through those um, interviews that you've shown, your viewers will know that these patients are people are inspirational right. in their commitment to live life and to live life fully. All right, let's let coming up soon in September is a walk for ALS, and this is people who are going to um, raise money for ALS. People who are concerned about this disease. We're going to look at a video clip of people uh, participating in the walk, and we'll talk about the walk a little bit when we come back. And I think this might help to um, answer. Uh, or make this a little bit larger than what we're talking about. Why people are involved in this? Why do they get involved with this? Well, we're going to see a video clip of why people are walking for ALS. Thank Check you. Check it out. It's a real easy walk. It's just great to get everybody together. It's a horrible, horrible disease, and we need to do something about it. You're walking with a group of people that are all motivated for the same cause. It's really cool. We need to make, get a cure for this disease, something. It's a cause that creates passion. It's a walk that starts close to the heart. It's the walk to defeat ALS. It's the work of the ALS Association. When we walk to defeat ALS, we walk in teams, corporate teams and family teams, teams that number from 40 to 400, teams that raise hundreds and thousands of dollars in the fight against ALS teams that raise awareness, a measurable awareness that brings us ever closer to our goals. Some of the people can't afford a wheelchair and an ALS association is able to help them. They have support groups, they have people that come pick them up in ambulettes and bring them to the doctor. Whatever you do, whatever you contribute, your commitment and support is appreciated by hundreds of thousands of people across America. Some days it's hard to have hope when you're living with a fatal disease that doesn't have a cure. But it's days like today where you look around and it's really easy to have hope. And it's all because of you. So thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you and your team at the next Walk to Defeat ALS. Well, we can see from the video of the people participating that they're very, very concerned about this. Tell us a little about the walk while we're, while we're it's fresh in our minds. Well, the walk really is a national event. There are over 150 walks to defeat ALS throughout the country. We do six here in Northern California, and they are extraordinary events of community. Mm -hmm. um, this is a devastating, horrific disease, right. and it's a family disease, as we discussed mm -hmm. earlier. But it is fundamentally and most profoundly a community disease. Mm -hmm. And so people affected by ALS want to make a difference in finding treatments and a cure mm -hmm. 
but also in supporting and caring for people who are living with the disease. Right. So the walks are an opportunity to come together to remember people who have lost the fight, mm -hmm. but as importantly, to support people who are living and are committed to living their yeah. lives today. And that's what the walk is about. And through team fundraising and individual contributions, we raise funds for research and patient mm -hmm. care throughout California and beyond. Mm -hmm. So it's an extraordinary statement of support, right. but it's also a very visible and real financial source mm -hmm. of support for our patient and family services mm -hmm. throughout California. Um, you had said something earlier that I think is very interesting. You said that you have no, you know, nobody in your immediate family that has ALS, and you, you are the, the the champion, championing the cause here in the Bay Area. How did you get involved with this? Well, I met patients. Okay. I met people living with the disease, and our chapter needed to be able to increase the funding for support for our treatments and for research. And I had been involved in a number of organizations as a CEO prior to my involvement with ALS. And the board and the patients came to me mm -hmm. and asked me to help. Mm -hmm. And I'd never thought about health care before. Right. But then the patients and families started to talk about their experiences. Mm -hmm. And I became committed, as committed as they are, to make a difference in this disease. And I think many people come to becoming involved with the fight against ALS because of their connection to patients. Because once right. you see someone living with this disease, mm -hmm. you will always remember mm -hmm. their eyes and their spirit. Yeah, I mean, I went to um, a film festival this year where they had a, a, one of the films was done by a person that had ALS and it was very interesting because he w the, the sister was interpreting what he was saying after he was at a press conference. It was, it was a very interesting thing and, and yet, I couldn't help but feel real, you know, it was it was just different because you could see the spirit in this person, in their eyes, you could see that there was something that they, they wanted to say and trying to say, and but were physically incapable of saying. And I would think, my God, that would be so frustrating if I couldn't talk, <laughs> you know, just drive me nuts. So how do you deal with these kinds of frustrations? With I mean, you must have families that come to you and say, oh, I don't know what to do. You know, I mean, That's right. So a couple of things we do is through our care and the specialist we provide for patients. And one of the things that's available to people today that was never available um, in the past was the opportunities to use modern technology mm -hmm. to communicate, whether it's lasers or computers Right. or very simple kinds of um, speech boards or yeah. um, synth uh, synthetic uh, voice devices. Okay. Um, having said that, nothing is more basic than the ability to communicate from person to person. Mm -hmm. And often, even with those technologies, in the end, that may be compromised. Right. But that's why I said earlier to you, when you look at their eyes, you become committed to making a difference for people living with ALS, mm -hmm. because no one should have to live with these kinds of challenges. And, and extreme challenges. That's correct. So when somebody comes to you and says, um, you know, we think that um, a family member, or they may say, I think, you know, I, I have some, might have Lou Gehrig's disease, what's the first thing that happens? What's well, the first thing we want to do is have them go to one of our centers to meet with neurologists who are trained and experienced in diagnosing this disease. ALS is very di dif difficult to diagnose, mm -hmm. and often there's an extended period of time where people go through the diagnosis. So it's very important, ultimately, to have someone experienced in the process diagnose mm -hmm. you. So we want them to go to our clinics to either get a second opinion or to have the initial diagnosis. And then we want them to work with specialists who are at the cutting edge of mm -hmm. the best kinds of treatment and yeah. care. Now some people decide to stay with local physicians mm -hmm. and that's fine. Right. But on a quarterly that security blanket. That's thing, right. Yeah. But on a quarterly basis it really makes a difference to work with clinicians that have the expertise in treating the disease. Mm -hmm. 
And then we do support groups for families and patients right. on a monthly basis. I would think you would have to do probably a lot of support groups we do. for families just to cope. It's That's hard right. to cope. And all of those are professionally facilitated. But in the end, patients and families can be wonderful supports to each other. Mm -hmm. So part of the value of what we provide is creating an environment where patients and families can come not only to take advantage of the expertise of the professional, right. but really the insights and uh -huh. support of living with the disease. Yeah, to come together as a community. No question. Can you re Remember an experience that really sticks out in your mind in all these years you've been working with ALS, a certain particular situation that, that really struck you in the heart? Yes, there is a member of our um, board who, his name is Lee. He had t fought two tours of duty in Vietnam. He has four purple hearts mm -hmm. and he was diagnosed with ALS. And he has lived with the disease now for 13 years. Wow. 50% of the people with ALS are dead within five years of diagnosis, three to five years. Well, that's, a, that's pretty brutal. Lee has outlived that. Mm -hmm. He is now confined to a wheelchair and an, on a ventilator. Mm -hmm. And at every meeting, he ends our meetings with the words inscribed on my wristband, never give up. Mm -hmm. and he will never give up, and by God, never will we. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, and hopefully, you know, this will inspire a lot more people to get involved with finding a cure for ALS and, and realizing that the, the human spirit lives on. And that was another thing, you know, the thing about that they stay cognitively well during all of this. You know, it's, it's got to be a hard thing. So, uh, folks, you know, get involved. Call the ALS Foundation and do what you can. Go to the march. You know, be visible. Let people know that you care. Um, we all need to care. That's what we really need to do in this life. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for watching our show tonight. And as always, if you're walking down the street and you see something inter interesting and you wonder to yourself, hey, what's up with that? Well, tune into our show. What's up with that? And maybe you'll find exactly what you're looking for. We'll see you next week on What's Up With That. Good night, everybody.